When you run an opera company, how do you choose your seasons? <laughs> Wait. Well, it's interesting because there you've run theater companies and you've chosen theater seasons, and you're an opera company. I'm wondering if the reflexes are the same. Um, to some extent, they are. I mean, first of all, you want a season that might sell tickets. You know, <laughs> that would be really good. And if you think of a opera company, because there's usually in a city, say, the size of Cleveland or Milwaukee or um, even Miami, there's only one, usually one opera company that, that can do anything of any size. So you think of it as a public library, and you have to do, you, you know, your public library just doesn't have Proust, right? It's got Proust, and it's got Henning Mankell, and it's got... Um, uh, Alice Monroe, and it has all kinds of things. So you start looking at what, what, what should we do? Well, you say, let's do a Verdi, 19th century, and then I always tried to do a new work, whatever the company was. And then you look at Mozart, do a Mozart, or you do Verismo, or so you try and balance a season. Then the major problem is, can you find the singers to sing the role? That's the, that's the difficult part, because voice types are so crucial in opera that, um, and and voices are, are um, um, so much a part of what the, the role is. So that if you have a Gilda in Rigoletto, you could have a soprano that's a little heavier and in voice, you know, or you could have a lighter soprano. Who's the tenor? Can you match the tenor and the and the and the soprano that the voices will blend, not f clash with each other? And sometimes you can say we'll do Rigoletto this year, but you can't find a Rigoletto because nobody's available, or there's no bass who can sing it. So you have to you have to bass baritone. So you have to change the repertoire to see what singers are around. Young singers tend not to be able to do the heavier roles because the voices aren't fully formed yet to get over the orchestra. But if you're in a small space, a nine, like Glimmerglass in Cooperstown, which is 900 seats, young voices can fill that. So there's a lot, of, there's a lot that goes into it. And, it. and then you get into costs. What's the size of the orchestra? How big a chorus do you need? Verdi needs a big chorus. Um, Handel doesn't. So that the choices are, are uh, so that the complexity is uh, the voice types. Can you find the singers? How big's the orchestra? How big's the chorus? Is there enough rehearsal time? Um, a three-hour rehearsal call for an orchestra is two hours and 25 minutes. Can you do the opera in that length of time? Or do you have to add an hour to a rehearsal? And how much does that cost? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the, it's, it's more complex than choosing a theater season um, because of the specialties of the voice. That, that's where the complexities are. And then if you're, I mean, when, when, when I did the theater season at Cleveland, I did it on a six-year plan, which is, you know, that an audience knows that in the next six seasons it's going to see six Verdi operas and how they develop, and it's going to see four new works, and it's going to see this. Um, uh, the board didn't like that in Cleveland, so I was no longer there. <laughs> so I left. <laughs> But that's, that's how I plan the season. And mounting operas in your theater, are they all new productions, or do you bring in productions? Good question. Um, uh, I wanted all new productions. Isn't that? Yes. So the, the board and I had big discussions about how much they were going to raise for the new productions. Now, we're talking about a season that's three or four operas only, so that's not... But if you're doing three or four new productions, it's a very year. expensive. It's very expensive, and you end up compromising, right. as you should. And if you do compromise, then you bring in someone else's production, or yeah, yeah. And and if you find the production that you really like, then you try and bring the director with it. Right. So. And how closely then do you work with your musical director, choosing the season, a lot. choosing the oh, singers? a lot, a lot, a lot. So in fact, casting is the two of you. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I would defer to the musical director always. Always. Because I wanted the good-looking girl, and she couldn't quite sing it, but 
he wanted the one who could sing it, so I have to defer. <laughs> and the pool of then talent of singers. Very you're much. working at a New York agents, you're working at a European agents. How do you actually, I mean, theater is more local. We yeah. usually draw the actors yeah. from the yeah. they're in, yeah. but opera is a larger community. Well, it, it is a larger community, but it's a smaller one. Every single singer at some point auditions in New York. Everyone, including the Canadian ones. Audition for the Met? Or? No, just general auditions. A general there, audition? For example, um, uh, Miami will be auditioning, and at the same time, auditions are always in November. All the companies come to New York and audition. So singers will then go and they'll audition for this company, they'll audition for that company, audition for that company. And then what happens is you get phone calls between the companies talking about various singers, how good they were, could they sing that, can they do the B flat, can blah, blah, blah. And I think some of it is, is garbage, and I think some of it is not. Some of it is garbage and because you get into tastes and snobbism and all that. Sure. Right. And in terms of the American singer balance and the Euro singer balance? I, don't, I haven't had a lot of experience with European singers because I tended to be with the American and the Canadians. And the Canadians have great singers these days, by the way. Really great singers. Yeah, there, are some, yeah. there are some remarkable ones. I mean, watching Opera Tellier um, over the years develop, mm -hmm. you know, because it was always bringing in the singers and slowly there are more and more singers own, from, yeah. from Toronto yeah. and Canada. And, that's yeah. it. and there are really good singers here, really good singers. Now again, your schizophrenia, your bi-hemisphere, here's my theater, here's my opera. You've sat in auditions with actors. Mm -hmm. Several times. Time. <laughs> you and Kurt Reese were auditioning, you remember? Mm. You sit in auditions with singers. What's the difference in those two experiences? Not a lot. You want everybody be good, to be good. Nobody wants to go to an audition and hear a bad actor. Nobody wants to go to an audition and hear a bad singer. What are you listening for in the, well, apart from the voice? Because often they say, auditioning actors, you know, there you are sitting here, and God, maybe even in this room there was an audition. Uh, you know, the next actor, the young Robert or whatever, Rick walks in the door, and you have an impression from the moment he walks in the door. Absolutely. And then there's a little bit of conversation, and then there's, well, which piece are you doing first? Is that the same with the singer? The Absolutely. moment they walk in the door, you have an impression. Absolutely. Absolutely. Same thing. It's exactly the same. Except if a singer is bad, it's really awful. <laughs> That's when I take the hearing aid out. <laughs> yeah, but bad acting can be really bad. It can be pretty bad, too. That's they don't what, usually get in the door. Well, you hope not. I mean, it's very different now, Robert, than it was 40 years ago. In terms, what terms? In terms of auditions and the numbers of actors. I mean, I come to Toronto, and I look at all the theaters, and I look at the casts, I think, I don't know anybody, nobody. Or then I see, ah, Fiona Reed, I know her. <laughs> but I don't know anybody. And there are many more actors now, more schools producing more actors. And, and I think on the whole, they're good. On the whole, the actors are good from what I've seen. Um, uh, but when we auditioned in the, in the early 70s for the, for the center, there were, the pool of actors was small. And, and and um, you knew them. Cause you, I mean, I went to every show in town and knew them. Um, uh, now, sometimes my casting wasn't so great. Um, You're talking about me? No. Robert, stop being paranoid. <laughs> you cast me as Bakushi or Romeo. And, and it was a brilliant piece of casting I made, Ad. It was. I was too young for it. I didn't know what I was doing, but I totally appreciated you doing it. And I was so excited to yeah. do it. And I was with Stephen Markle and Dominique Blythe and Alan Royal and all these big actors. And they were good. Do you remember what I wore? No, that I don't remember. You don't remember my costume? I don't. A lemon yellow pantsuit. Lemon yellow top, lemon yellow bottom. Do you remember that in, by act two I'd taken off the top and was just wearing my shirt? Actually, I do. That somehow I, re, I no, I don't. <laughs> I remember nothing of that because I hate lemon yellow. So how, how did that get on the stage? <laughs> it's like Guthrie's story, when you know Mariah, uh, uh, the Olivia hates yellow, and the costume designer had put Mariah in yellow, and Guthrie said, "Well, there's yellow and yellow." <laughs> 
it's funny because it sparked a lot of things. You know, if I go on long drives, I try to, you know, maybe like a singer, I try to keep words doing. So I've gone back to, oh, then I see Queen Mab has been with you. She's the fairy's midwife and she comes and she... I try Good to keep you. that moving yeah. as a series of you. thoughts. And that's what we did together. And I'm eternally grateful. Wow.